As we come to read the scripture, we're going to read from Psalm 36. Let's first of all pray. Lord, we pray that uh, the reading of your word may bring insight into our hearts and minds, because Lord, we thank you that this is truth. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is able to apply it to each one of us, Lord, in whatever way you see fit. And so, Lord, as we consider these words tonight, we pray that you will be pleased to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 36, for the choir director, Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. That's a good start, isn't it? A Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. That isn't what the translators have put in, that's what's in the original Hebrew. It may even be what David himself penned. That he simply saw himself as the servant of the Lord, even although he was king. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. And then what a contrast. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come upon me. And let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise. So particularly taking up those words, the fountain of life, we so often sing the words based upon this uh, uh, this psalm. And yet I think sometimes the very familiarity of it means that we don't uh, really consider it deeply enough. And I just found myself uh, on uh, Friday as I was preparing the word, uh, thinking about uh, a fountain of life, a fountain of life, not the fountain of life. I was looking at the book of Proverbs, and we'll come to that a little later, but it brought me back to this uh, very psalm. The fountain of life there in verse 9. The Hebrew word for fountain is uh, makor, which comes from ker, to dig a well. And uh, therefore, I think instead of the word fountain, we might think in terms of a well being dug so that a source of water might be found, rather than a fountain in Trafalgar Square or some other great city, or even a, a garden fountain. This is much more the necessity of life, and the very phrase, the fountain of life, would remind us that it is absolutely essential, water is absolutely essential for life itself. Uh, We wouldn't live very long without any water. And we have only to think of those oases that are in the desert uh, to remind ourselves, particularly how in the Middle East, water was such uh, an important commodity. In fact, at this time of the year, Israel constantly prays for rain. It's been a good season for them so far. Uh, They've had plenty of rain and snow, but uh, there have been several years of Not exactly drought, but certainly drier seasons than usual. So for us, water isn't that important in that sense. We just turn on a tap and it's there. And even in the past, with our uh, rainy uh, seasons, uh, a well in the garden would probably be sufficient to see us right through without any problem at all. But this is the very essence of life, the, uh, the source of life. The fountain of life. And so the psalmist says, for we you is the fountain of life. Yeah, perhaps we need to go back just before that a little bit to consider what goes before so that we may understand exactly how we find this source of life 
this well-being, this sustenance of life, what, in what is it grounded? Well, it goes just before, your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. And uh, in other pas- passages there, in other parts there, it talks about, oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. I've said many times that word, sometimes translated in the author of Bible's version as mercy, uh, but loving kindness is probably a good translation. It's the word chesed in Hebrew, which has very much to do with God's covenant love. But God has set his love upon them as a, as a chosen people. And for us that's a remarkable thing, isn't it? That God has actually set his love upon us. And we've seen it particularly in Christ. That loving kindness that sought to redeem the world. The loving kindness that saved you. And you wouldn't be where you are tonight if it wasn't for his loving kindness. And then, of course, it goes on to talk about your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens the extent of it. Thank God we do have some scientific knowledge about the extent of the heavens and the vastness of them. And uh, perhaps to previous generations it wasn't known in the same way, except that we've sent up uh, satellites up there and we've got onto or sent up satellites onto Mars and the moon and so on. And yet they're relatively close and we've not explored the, the universe. So how great is God's loving kindness that he has set his love upon yours and uh, you and mine. We cannot measure the loving kindness of God. I suppose that's why Paul asked, prayed that they might know the length and height and depth and breadth of the, the love of God, although it is beyond knowledge, as he said. But he wanted them in some way to be immersed, to be experiencing that love, even although they could not know the full extent of it. And here is part of the reason why God is that fountain of life. And then there's faithfulness. How important is that? Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Again, another dimension that cannot be measured. God's absolute faithfulness. When God says something, we can utterly rely on it. People might say they'll help us tomorrow and they don't turn up or they forget. But God is absolutely faithful in every way. What he has said, he has done and will do. But we can rely on him because he's absolutely reliable. And then he talks about his righteousness as like the mountains of God. Or the mighty mountains that can be translated. Because Elohim sometimes has that idea of might and power well, as well as being God. And I think in many ways there's probably something of the idea there because it goes on to compare the great deep as to where the depths of the ocean were the mighty mountains. And again, almost immeasurable for us. But there they stand, the mountains, in such majestic form. I don't know about you, but I always get impressed when I see the mountain ranges, and particularly with snow, whether it's in the Alps or other parts of the world, it's just so impressive that the strength and the power that is there. But the righteousness of God is like the mountains, those mighty mountains, absolutely immovable. So we can rely on God's righteousness. And then it talks about his judgments. His judgments are like a great deep. I suppose we often think, uh, when we think, uh, see the word judgment, we think of God judging us, punishing us. And while there may be an aspect of that, and of course, when we consider just something of the punishment of God regarding hell and so on, it's something that perhaps we should keep in mind. But basically, the idea here is God's rulings. His statements, his ordinances that he's laid down. So again, we have God's rulings as to what is right for mankind and what is harmful to mankind. And they're so important for us. And again, can they fully be explored as we understand something of the things that God has laid out in his word? Thank God we are able to at least understand something of it. 
And then it goes on to say, O Lord, you preserve man and beast. And the, the word there for preserve comes from the, the word uh, uh, to, to save. So again, it's the idea that God saves even the creatures that he watches over them. Uh, but particularly that saving grace, that preserving grace that is there for every one of us. Probably all of us have experienced that in some way we've been in danger and the Lord has rescued us. I have a few rescues um, in my own life. I um, was uh, cycling home from school. I could have been killed when I uh, sort of had tucked in behind a bus on my uh, bicycle and, and decided to make a right turn and did see the car coming the other way and uh, I could have easily been killed there and one or two other occasions in my life. But God is very often gracious to us. He's watching over us to preserve us. This is the sort of God that we deal with. We are reminded this morning of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he was both God and man. A meekness and majesty as was shared. But again, when we try to fathom the character of God, how amazing is our God. But it comes down to the fact that in the end, we need to take refuge. If we're going to find him as a fountain of life, we need to take refuge in the shadow of his wings, it says. And the children of men take uh, refuge in the shadow of your wings. What a place to be under the protection of God. To know that he shelters us. Perhaps as a reminder from the Lord Jesus Christ that there are times when God would want to gather us, that Jesus would want to gather us as a hen gathers its chips under its wings for protection. And we would not. So we have to actually come and take refuge under the shadow of his wings. He won't force us. He won't come along like some, I was going to say like some mother hen, but uh, that would be the wrong guy. He wants to come as a mother hen in, in, in many ways, but he will not force us to get under his wing. Because he's given us free will, but he's there to give that shelter, that protection. Isn't it marvelous when the storms of life are on that we know there's somewhere that we can go for protection, for refuge, for help, for strength. Then, of course, there's another thing that we need to do. We need to drink. It says, they drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And you give them to drink of the river of your delights. It's not just a measly cup of water. God is offering us the river of his delights, a flood, if you like. Of, uh, we're not talking about earthly pleasures, but we're talking about his grace. We're talking about his mercy. We're talking about his love. We're talking about his uh, preservation. We're talking about the way in which he provides for us in so many ways. We find such an abundance in God's house. But when it comes to it, he is the source of that fountain of life. From him comes life in the first place. He created us. But of course from him comes that eternal life. And while we get a glimpse here of something that very much comes home to us in the New Testament, nevertheless the psalmist has seen that here is the source of life itself. And he realizes there is such a, such a wealth uh, uh, of help from God, that very source of life. And so really we come to the New Testament just to remind ourselves there in John chapter 10 of what Jesus said, putting it even more clearly for those of us who are perhaps a little bit slow to grasp these things. And I don't need to remind you of these uh, things because you know it full well. But again it uh, says there in John chapter 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, It's not something that we have to strive after to reach eternal life. It's a well springing up, as uh, we're reminded in these scriptures. And the sad thing is that many have striven in so many different ways to try to find their salvation. The wages of sin may be uh, death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. It's as simple as that. We receive that eternal life is a gift. 
And uh, Jesus goes on to say there, uh, and uh, if you knew who, um, knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him. And he would have given you living water. You would have asked of him. Thank God she came to that place eventually. She said, uh, Lord, uh, give me that water that I don't have to come all this way to draw. Here is a wearisome uh, woman. But she's beginning to discover where life is found, the fountain of life. And it's living water. can be translated running water. And as I've said before, I've been to this well just once. Uh, because it's in so-called occupied territory, and the time we went there was in 1979, and things were a bit tense then, but uh, not as tense as they became later. But looking down into that well at uh, Sychar, uh, I was absolutely sure I could see the water moving across the, the face of the w- uh, well down the bottom. It was sunk into a river, it was moving, it was alive, if you like. It wasn't stagnant. But here is the water of life. God is that source, that fountain of life, and in Christ, he offers that that source of living water because of what he is going to do. goes on to say, but whoever drinks of it shall never thirst again. What a statement. Because here in Christ is the real satisfaction for life. Even as a teenager, I found that life began to have meaning when I came to faith in Christ. Just didn't make sense before. It was an existence. But when we come to Him, that doesn't mean to say there's not times when we feel down and uh, feel despondent or things go badly with us for one reason or another. But when we've come and drunk of that water, we know that there's no other source that we can go to. It's only in Christ. Never thirst again. And of course he goes on to say, it will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. I'm not even going to go on to John 7, which we could do, where Jesus says again that we should come to him and drink, and that of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That God actually fills us with his spirit so that that spirit flows out to other people. But here's that source of eternal life springing up within us. It's something that happens within. It's not all out there. It's within. That fountain of life springs up within us. God, of course, is that life. It's his life being lived out in us. But here is the absolutely essential thing that we need as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to come to him. But actually, I didn't start there. I started in Proverbs. And there it doesn't talk about the fountain of life. It talks about a fountain of life. And of course, the one that I immediately found myself thinking about uh, was that the fear of the Lord is a a fountain of life. It's in Proverbs chapter uh, 14 and verse 27. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. That one may avoid the snares of death. That's where it starts. It starts with reverence for God. It's one of the reasons why when in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 2, when we're told to pray for all mankind and for those in authority, one of the things that we're to to pray for is that there might be reverence. Uh, Because basically when there is something of that fear of God, that reverence of God, we're more likely to listen to the gospel. If we have no reverence for God, then we just brush these things off uh, and we even dismiss that there is a God. So this is a very good start to have reverence for God. If we're really to discover in the end that fountain, the fountain of life. But I found it interesting that in a sense you and I can be something of a fountain as well. Obviously in no way like God or like the Lord Jesus Christ. But in chapter 10, moving on too quickly, press the button again. Chapter 10 it says that the mouth of the the righteous is a fountain of life. Uh, Proverbs 10 and uh, verse 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. But the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. 
And uh, the lips of the discerning, uh, on the lips of the, the discerning, wisdom is found, and so on. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Those who are walking righteously, those who are going God's way, obviously understand something of what God is able to do. So even from our mouth can come something of a, a word of life to people. We can point them in the right direction. And of course that's part of what re- is required of us. And 13, uh, 14, Proverbs 13 and verse 14 has much the same idea. But I notice just the words that went around it in verse 13. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it. But the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching, or in the authorized version, it's the law of the wise is a fountain of life. But do remember that uh, the word Torah comes from Yara, which means to teach. And I think it's much better here, uh, the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life. Because we've allowed the commandment of God, the word of God, we don't despise it, we receive it, we recognize it, then we're able to uh, have that, uh, that wise word for people. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn aside the snares of death. Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool displays folly. And so on. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life. Surely we ought to be imparting something, uh, the knowledge of God, so that others can find that the fountain of life. But we can help to bring something of life to others as God uses us. And then again in chapter 16, something of the same idea is there. Chapter 16 and verse 22. But again, it's worth looking at the words that go before. Uh, In verse 20, Proverbs 16, verse 20. He who gives attention to the word will find good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. The wise in heart will be called understanding, and sweetness of speech increases pervasiveness. Understanding is a fountain of life to one who has it. But the discipline of fools is folly. The heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. I think all of that ties in with the matter of understanding. When we have a correct understanding from God, then we're able to impart something of life to others, even something of healing to them. As we bring that word. Now of course it doesn't uh, compare with the fact that God is the fountain of life. But we are used of God to bring something of life to other people. Mind we do have to be wise. I think there's a time to be quiet. And just pray. Sometimes we do more harm than good when we try to rush in. The old expression fools rush in where angels fear to tread is very true. And uh, Jesus told us not to cast our pearls before swine. We have to be wise. There's a judgment that has to be made there. uh, First comes in the whole passage about judgment. Not being stupid in our judgment when we try to take a plank out of somebody else's eye. When we've got a, a, rather, take a speck out of somebody else's eye when we've got a plank in our own. A bit difficult, that. Uh, The the picture is marvellous, really. But we sometimes try to do that. But equally, we do have to make right judgments when it comes to sharing the word. Is it right to keep quiet? But I think so often many of us miss the opportunity uh, that we don't bring that wise word in, uh, in season. But then, of course, it goes on to talk, uh, going back to Psalm uh, 36. It says, in your light we see light. I put up on this section, Heaven's Light, Our Guide. Actually, that's uh, the motto of uh, the city of Portsmouth. And uh, there's the coat of arms up there. uh, That great football club that uh, once did so well in the 50s, a long time ago now, uh, has the the blue emblem there with the uh, star and uh, the crescent. 
Someone really wrote to me uh, a little while ago and said Portsmouth's become a Muslim city. They've got a Muslim uh, uh, sign uh, now. Well, not at all. This is 700 years old, actually, that apparently. So uh, I think it goes back a long time. And the motto for the city then was Heaven's Light, Our Guide. Which is exactly what the psalmist is saying, really. In your light we see light. We don't see anything properly until we allow the light of God to come in. And how vital is that light? Because in the first place, God said, let there be light. He ordered light. And you know what it's like sometimes trying to grope around in the dark. It's okay if it's a moonlight night, but uh, particularly in a house when there's been a power cut or an outage, as our American friends say. We had a power outage uh, during the week, but our neighbors kindly invited us in. Uh, but otherwise, we would have been... At, Went off at four o'clock, so we were all right. We could have found some candles and we put on the gas fire for a while, but uh, uh, it would have been a bit uh, much uh, just sitting there in the dark. We would have been still in darkness if it hadn't been for God, and certainly God gave light in the wilderness, didn't he? And we remember how important that was, that even at night they knew where to go with the Egyptians pursuing them. God gave them the, the way through. How vital was that light? And thank God, too, that the cloud came behind them, as we were thinking last week, to protect them. But so vital was that light in many ways. And what is all about this light is God's revelation. Without God's revelation, and that's what light is all about, we would be in the dark. We would still be groping around in our sin. But in God's light, we have seen light. We have understanding now. We know where we should be going. And of course we remember that it says in uh, Isaiah 9, those words we so often think about, that those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On them the light has shone. And into our dark world light has come in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, thank God that David understood that there was a real measure of light for him in God's revelation to him. And, and he had a lot revealed to him. When we think of some of those, uh, those psalms that he wrote, particularly Psalm 2, about God installing his king, and even if they're plotting against the Lord and his anointed, God has the last word, so the kings of the earth ought to be wise and submit to him. He saw that one day every enemy would be put under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God would ordain it, sir. Had glimpses there that few have seen. Light had already shone into his heart. But that fullness came with Messiah himself, the light of the world. Jesus being that light. Again, we think of it very much at Christmas and we don't need to think of these things just at Christmas, do we? We need to be reminded again and again. Because in John chapter 1, it says about light shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not comprehended or quenched it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or did not quench it. You may say, why is there this difference that the darkness didn't comprehend it or did not quench it. Well, in one sense, both are true. And really, what the Greek word means there, it says katalambano, which means to lay hold of or to grasp or to seize. So the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness, people who were in the dark, Satan and so on, could not grasp what God was doing in Christ. I think at Calvary, Satan must have thought he won the victory. He just snuffed out the light. He hadn't grasped it, but he didn't snuff it out, thank God. Both are true. But the light shines in the darkness. That light in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the true light that comes into the world. We've often gone this way, and I find myself coming back to it again and again, that he is the light of life. I am the light of the world, says Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 12. And again, the setting of that is so appropriate. Because it's right in the Feast of Tabernacles that he makes this statement. And it's at the Feast of the Tabernacles that that great candelabra is set up in the, uh, in the courts, in the women's court particularly. 
and the light shines out in the whole of Jerusalem. That uh, wasn't a large city at that time, of course. We can see it, we know just how big it was by the walls that were built there by Suleiman the Great. So we know it wasn't a vast area, but the light there was enough to illuminate the city, really. And of course it's remembering that God was there in the wilderness, the light guiding them. But here again Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world in uh, verse John 8 and verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. We thought of the fountain of life, here we have the light of life. In your light we see light. Just think of it, it's when the light is on, we have light and we can see. If there is no light, we are in darkness. Thank God, Jesus, the light of the world, has shone in your heart and mine. And in John chapter 12 and verse 46, much of the same is said there, that uh, those who believe in him do not walk in darkness, but walk in light. And in the middle of those two statements, in chapter 8 and chapter 12, and I think again it's echoed in the, the healing of the blind man. You can imagine what it's like. You may have pray, played blind man's buff from time to time, had to scarf around your neck and uh, around your neck, around your eyes. Uh, I'd like to put it around your neck sometimes, uh, but, uh, uh, around your eyes. Uh, and you're groping around in the dark trying to catch somebody, I think was the idea in the game. Uh, and uh, you could have stumbled over all sorts of things. But because we believe in Christ, we're not in darkness any longer. So we, we are able to see, we're able to understand things that the world can't understand. Paul says that himself. He talks about the philosophy, the wisdom of the world. But that wisdom doesn't bring them to salvation. It's only in Christ that we find salvation. And we might remind ourselves again that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, that it says, The God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of, the, uh, uh, of God in the face of Christ Jesus. So God brought light in creation, but God has brought light into your life. In his light, we see light. We've seen the splendor and the glory of God that we could not see, we could not understand before. David was sharing something of the wonder, as I was saying earlier, the wonder of, a, of God taking a human form, being God and man at the same time. That the Creator should actually become our Savior. In your light, we see light. You know, we can sing those words so easily, can't we, without really grasping it. It just goes in... I was going to say goes in one ear and comes out the other. It comes out of our mouth with, with very little help, help uh, uh, taking place in between. But when we really think of these words, and all that particularly went before regarding the nature of God, what a source of life, and what a source of light. We don't look anywhere else for understanding but to God. But just as we can be a fountain of life, the remarkable thing is that we can actually be light. I mean, I think it's incredible that Jesus said, having said, I am the light of the world, said, you are the light of the world. Incredible. Now, of course, in no way are we to be compared with with the Lord Jesus Christ. In no way can we reveal God. In no way can we show the heart of God as far as salvation is concerned. But we need to let our light shine before men. As, uh, as Jesus yet said. We're not to cover it up. We're not to hide our light. We're not to put it under a bushel in the old authorised version. Not to put it under a bucket. Whatever way you want to translate that. Nathan was in with us last night before he went to bed because his parents had gone out and we were babysitting. Oh, that's a subject in poor Nathan and Caleb to our, uh, our looking after them. 
But he had heard that we had a torch. I think it came out with Pepper Pig or something having a torch. And he wanted to see this torch. And when he got, the, uh, got hold of it, for I reckon 10 minutes, he was going around our front room shining the torch on everything. Uh, said, there's the flowers, there's your picture. Uh, and he, you know, it was better than any other toy that uh, he might have. He was just occupied with it. But the light does illuminate things, doesn't it? It does show things up. And sometimes just by our lives, we can bring conviction of sin sometimes, but an awareness to other people that they need God. We need to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works, our good deeds. Even sometimes something of those miracles because God's wanting to work his deeds through us, his works through us, that they might see that and glorify our Father in heaven. And then the Apostle Paul says, you were once darkness. Not just that we were in the dark, we were darkness. Darkness is again to do with ignorance, as light is revelation, but light is also righteousness, and darkness is to do with evil. And that's the place we were. So he says in Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 8, that looks to me to be the wrong reference. I mean Ephesians 5, I'm sure. I do mean Ephesians 5 when I get that. Sorry about that. Yes, uh, I know it's verse 8, yep. It says... Um, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The fruit of the light consists in all godness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, because that's what light does, doesn't it? And so we could go on. You were once darkness. But now you're light, because the light has shone within us. A child was once asked uh, what a saint was, and he said, it's a person through whom the light shines. He was thinking of those stained glass windows and uh, seeing the light coming through in all the colours and so on. Well, a saint is one through whom the light shines, the light of God, because his light has come within. And you may remember, and I think in uh, actual fact, um, uh, I've forgotten his name now, Roy Sacker uh, was last week uh, referring to this, Robert Sacker was it, uh, that uh, about a shaft of light, and I think he was referring to us, but he, I think he mentioned this, that we need to shine as lights in a dark and crooked world. It's getting more and more perverse, this perverse generation it speaks about there. And how true that is. But we're to shine as lights in that dark world. Philippians 2 verse 15. So that you will do all things without grumbling or disputing. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God. Above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. He wanted them to be living in such a way that he knew that his preaching of the gospel, his teaching, was such that they were shining the light of Christ into a dark world. So just these words, uh, these are my reflections really on thinking about the fountain of life. And that in God's light, we have light. Friends, what a privilege when it comes to it. And David had a, a real understanding of that. It was in the person of God himself that that fountain of life could be found and that light could be found. But in Christ, we have a greater revelation of that source of life that is in him. And that light that shone into our lives. Well, may the Lord help us not only to drink and continue to drink from that fountain of life, but to be in a measure a fountain ourselves. 
to again reflect upon the light of God shining in a dark world and ourselves to be at least something of a light in a dark world too. Isn't it marvellous that he actually entrusts us to reveal something of who he is and his person and character? What amazing grace. What an amazing responsibility too. May God help us. So we can just sing quietly. I don't think we need the, the words. I'm sure we know it uh, well enough. Oh, how precious, O oh Lord, is your unfailing love. How precious, O oh Lord, is your unfailing love. We find refuge in the shadow of your wings. We feast, Lord Jesus, on the abundance of your house and drink on the river of delights. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we find light. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we find light. Well, Lord, our singing may not be almost, it's not very good to keep in tune there, Lord, but we want to thank you that you are the fountain of life, that in your light we do see light. And Lord, we just want to thank you again for the richness of your person, your character, your nature, and all that you've revealed to us. And Lord, we would ask too that our mouths may be something of a fountain of life to others, our wisdom, our understanding. Lord, that uh, because you've shone your light into our hearts and lives, something of that light may shine through us and may help others to find the light of life. So help us so to live, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.